instead, instead uh, say that uh, we're going to talk about the uh, priority in the free software, what we did on current ah. status, and uh, what, which are the freedom problems? Well, I'll try to remember them. I'm extremely sleepy. I see. And you can't expect me to remember issues just because I was thinking about them sometime in the past and week is, day. Uh, be a But if people, if other people bring one up, yeah. then I'll remember what I thought about. Excellent. So you, you already did uh, talk at the World Planet about similar things. That doesn't mean I remember it. That ah. was seven months ago. <laughs> okay. Come on. Uh, Richard, can we get you some tea or Pepsi? Uh, you could try making some tea. I just had some pizza. Okay. Unfortunately, just having had so pizza, so pizza mm -hmm. has made me quite sleepy. I see. I have a tea bag here. If yeah. somebody wants to boil water and then, say, fill a cup like this with boiling water with the tea bag already in it, sure. then it will make good tea. Right. <laughs> okay. But uh, I guess I need a microphone. Uh, yeah, we can use this for questions, and you can use that. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> So, there's a question of what our priorities should be. How should we decide what's an important project? And I think it's important to distinguish based on the size of the project. Because some very important projects consist of develop free software to handle that particular field. Right? That might be a very large job something that might, you might expect to take five years if you work at it very hard. Those can be extremely important. So importance is clearly one of the dimensions we should consider. But such a thing, a large project like that can't be urgent. If you think of it as urgent, all you're doing is making yourself miserable. It can't be done next week. No matter how hard anyone tries, it's going to take years. There are other projects which are much smaller and are it, looked at in the long term. They're not as important, but they're, they're urgent to fix some problem that we have. So those I would think of as the priority projects and the others I think of as the very important projects. So I'm going to set up at the FSF two separate lists, the very important projects and the urgent projects. The urgent projects clearly have to be a lot smaller, small enough that somebody could conceive what we do them in a few months. It's no sense calling it urgent if it's going to take five years. So the list that we now have labeled as priority projects really ought to be important projects. They were chosen based on their importance to the free software field for a long term and most of them are too big to do in a short time. So I plan to call those the very important projects, uh, unless I can find a better name for that. If someone wants to suggest a better name, I'd appreciate it. But uh, then there should be a list of the high priority projects, which are smaller projects that somebody could do in the next two months, if only we find somebody to try.
Is there any other topic someone wants to bring up? What do you define as very important projects for the time being? Oh, well, the projects that we need urgently generally are not as important as the big, very important projects. They're important compared with other small things people can do. There is some, there's some important problem that will get solved if only a person writes this particular piece of code. And we also have a high priority reverse engineering projects list, which GNU2 has just been kind enough to, uh, to update. Reverse engineering projects are often the only way to advance towards liberating certain hardware. That's what makes them particularly important. In effect, the whole community is waiting for them. And Thank you. Is there a pillow? <laughs> <laughs> it's embedded in a chair. <laughs> uh, that's not a good place for me to put my head on. Unless I get down on the floor and kneel. So beyond the fact that we need some things now, so they, they can be small, uh, can we also distinguish between we need some things now which are complicated and we need a very uh, advanced pers people, person to do it, or these are simple things that uh, people can do in a uh, few days? Well, yeah. you could distinguish them, it's yes. true. Yes. In principle, you can make that distinction. You could try to order that list in terms of which ones are easy or hard. But people who are thinking of doing them, I expect, could judge that for themselves. And how hard something is depends on your background. Technical or non-technical? Well, these would all be technical projects. In general, if we need something urgently, it's going to be a technical project. There are things that would be very nice to have, but they're not desperately needed. For instance, we would like to have manuals for a lot of free programs that currently don't have any free manual. But nothing horrible is going to, we're not going to lose in a very bad way for not having that manual this year. But there, there are things like uh, making all ATI cards work with Linux Libre. This only requires the hardware to test and it's very easy to do so. Oh. Well, I guess that could be in the uh, ur urgent smaller projects mm -hmm. list when we have it. I have a question which uh, relates more to what is important in my life um, in regards to free software. And that is uh, um, the difficulties that I'm facing in uh, at least convincing other people to think about free software. That is difficult everywhere. What I find is that there are people who simply have no interest. You can't do anything about that. They're, they have sort of one-track minds. They're thinking about how easily can I get this and that with my computer? And they don't care at all about freedom. They don't care about privacy. I believe, I speculate, that the fact that so many conveniences are now available if you throw away your privacy 
has convinced a lot of people not to value their privacy because if they did value their privacy, they would start being bothered by the things that they've decided to do. And they'd start feeling that they need to stop doing some of those things and that would be inconvenient. Yeah. So it's very sad, but what, we, what this means is that uh, nasty phones are systematically teaching people to stop caring about letting Big Brother know everything they're doing. And I was thinking, you mentioned the uh, ease of use and uh, uh, this is the reason why people keep using uh, proprietary software. And Sorry, I couldn't hear the beginning of that. So you mentioned you mentioned that uh, uh, people keep using uh, proprietary software because it's easy to use. Or it's well, it does various things for them. Yeah, yeah. And they don't have to go to extra lengths to get the job done. Uh, like something well, like maybe. learning. But nowadays, it's just that there are various things that you can do with a proprietary app that talks to a, a spying server. And you can't use those disservices with free software because they only work with that particular rack. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's it, you know. It, so this is different from the case where yes, there's a free program that does this, but it doesn't have all the features, so it's more work to use it. That happens too, but these are different, and I think that the proprietary corrupts affect more people, influence more people. So I was thinking, so some people say that uh, in order to attract people to free software, free software should be more user friendly or, or more similar to, to, to do the things that uh, proprietary software can do. Uh, but well, sometimes, my opinion is that um, this is not the best way to, to draw people towards free software because it keeps teaching them to value ease of use instead of uh, uh, the core values of free well, software. Well, actually, these are two different questions. These are not two views on the same question. They're talking about two different questions. One is, would we, be more, would we bring more people to use free software and teach more people about freedom if we made some free programs more convenient. And the other is, which argument should we present, which are, or which argument should we prioritize in our discourse? So I prioritize freedom in my discourse, but I agree it would be a good thing if some free programs work more conveniently. Making the programs work more conveniently doesn't stop us from focusing on freedom when we talk about it. Uh, I have some comments on. Uh, 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 I have some comments on the issue. Yeah, if the program is more convenient, that enables more people that want freedom to get freedom because they are able to use it, and so. Um, Maybe to make program more convenient, people should, uh, like free software developers, should interact more with the people that uh, have issue or trouble using the software, like in install party or things like this, to understand better the need of such people. Well, uh, I think that probably with the rise of AI and machine learning, there is also a problem of uh, free uh, data sets because uh, you can, your machine learning application cannot compete well against proprietary ones if, say, you owe a lot of training data. Yes. Uh, regarding that, a few months ago, someone in the field told me that people have developed programs that can uh, start with a trained neural network and alter it to respond differently to selected cases. 
In other words, you, you know, I, I used to think that the trained neural network was the output of a compiler, not an ordinary compiler, but you could think of it as like a compiler, and the training data was the source code. And that was a big problem for us because we couldn't possibly make the data sets of training data and the ones that exist are mostly secret. And uh, however, if you can modify the trained neural network so it does what you want it to do, then it becomes more like source code. Oh, you certainly can do some transfer learning, but uh... Anyway, it's limited and uh, also uh, if you want to have different uh, architecture, probably it's not that easy just to reverse engineer, to take a uh, trained proprietary uh, neural network and just uh, do transfer learning. Well, I don't know the term transfer learning, I'm sorry. I've total, I'm totally lost when you use that term. Ah, I mean when you have already trained uh, neural network? you can uh, teach your fresh neural network based on some weights that you have in a trained uh, network. Oh, that's okay. what it means. That, yes, uh, that's not the same thing I'm thinking about. Uh, I was told, at least this is how I understood it, that there are programs you can use to modify a trained neural network so it will accept those cases or so it will reject those cases. So if you have a trained neural network to do job A, you can modify it to do job A prime without having to start from the train from the training data. Well you can add you can add additional uh, samples without having the initial data set. But, uh, I mean, if you make a machine learning software that is free and open source, uh, it's very hard to... Anyway, if you don't have the, da the data sets to train it, it's still very hard to compete. So maybe it is important to have uh, enough free uh, open uh, data sets uh, for free programs. We won't be able to get that. Here's why. The training data is often gigantic. It was collected by somebody, some organization, and that organization typically makes it available only with a specific signed contract for non-disclosure. So it's not, it's, it's more secret than Windows. Windows, at least people can get binaries of. But these training data are impossible to get except under totally unethical conditions and paying, probably paying a substantial amount of money. And for most, you, for most people, they would refuse to deal with you. So the only way we could have a free training data set is to collect one. But how are we going to collect these training data sets? Like uh, OpenStreetMap or uh, Map of Jess and Tora or things like this? Well, those are two, s those are not relevant, I think, very much to machine learning. But if you look at OpenStreetMap, you could get an idea of how big a, a, each job would be. So OpenStreetMap has been going for many years, and in some parts of the world it's pretty thorough, and in some parts of the world it has lots of gaps a lot of people have had to contribute. Yeah. So, for each job, you might have to have a project the size of OpenStreetMap. Ah, okay. That would make it very hard. You know, you could run one of those, but could you run thousands of them and have them make good progress? I tend to think no. In a few cases, people will find clever ways to do it. However, what I, what I hope for is that we can get by with editing a free trained neural net. Mm. So if somebody trains a neural net and releases the, the trained weights, if we can 
modify them to change the job in any way we wish, then we're doing okay. And we don't need any of the training data that was used to make it. We can treat it, if we can edit it to do something different, then we can treat it as source code. Now in this case the editing would not mean changing specific weights by hand. It would mean running a program that alters the weights so that instead of doing job A, they do job A prime. Honestly, I'm a bit skeptical about this. But well, for... I don't know. The person who told me about this is in the field, so I, so I trust him. Mm. But actually for open data sets there are, I mean, crowdsourcing efforts and in different fields, especially in science, there are quite a I lot of... I feel uncomfortable every time the word open is used. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you possibly avoid that word. Uh, I feel that I'm obliged to, to uh, comment about disliking that word every time it's brought up, because otherwise our campaign for freedom will be uh, watered down by this weak idea of open. Just say free data. Free data. Okay, free data. <laughs> yeah. You can express yourself with that expression. But uh, there, there are available data sets on for some things, but a lot of important things, for instance, having to do with speech and writing, are not available to us in forms that we could directly use. That's and that would be the, the few projects uh, the size of OpenStreetMap that can be run by the face of our community. Speech and maybe, but then consider that there are a lot of there are maybe a lot of vision tasks that you'd want to train a neural network to do, and each one would require its own training data set. Yeah. But if we have like nothing working, uh, no, if, if we have like uh, um, speech recognition working. This would set an example and it might help like state institution to who knows things like that. So maybe we There's no use yeah. speculating about it because that's several steps down the road anyway. Mm. If we want to make progress in free software and machine learning, uh, we don't even need to worry about that yet, because it'll be some years before we get there and during that time things may change. So if you want to work on the first step now, by all means do. But don't worry about exactly how we're going to do the 10th step or the 50th step. It's better to cross those bridges when we come to them. In Europe, uh, we've got uh, the so-called uh, data protection laws, uh, which are effective in some ways. Uh, and one implication of that could be, for example, if you've got a, a machine learning algorithm which depends on sometimes personal data, uh, that could be illegal in Europe or could be declared as illegal at some point because it depends on... Uh, I don't see why. Because people cannot remove themselves from the machine because you cannot identify exactly how one particular personal data maps to the weights of the machine. Well, since it doesn't actually have any of any individual's personal data in, in it, in the trained machine, uh, maybe removal is a no -op. Yeah, I think, I think that the uh, uh, neural network is like uh, conclusions drawn based on the data. So I think it, you can ask to remove your personal data from somewhere, but I don't think you can ask them to remove the conclusions that they drew based on your personal data. So I, I don't feel like it would apply. 
I mean, what's like uh, the legal idea of the fruit of the bad tree, right? Can you can keep it? Not necessarily. No? Who knows if that idea is even pertinent here? You're making that maybe that would depend on details of the scenario, which is in a purely hypothetical scenario anyway. So that might just be some constraints on how you have to go about the project. Maybe it's a question we should ask. Maybe it's not about Someone can ask, uh, if you want to do such a project, that in it, and you want to do it in Europe, and you want it, and it concerns using personal data, then I guess you should find out. But on the other hand, if you get the cooperation of organizations that have collected some personal data for their own operations in some way, and if that's you know, if running your neural network over those will help train it. Maybe they can run it for you, and that way they're not actually giving any of their members' personal data to it to you or to anyone. So they're probably not violating the data protection laws. Data protection laws are very important, but they tend to have a terrible gap, a glaring flaw, which is they don't protect you <coughs> from the organization that above all you need protection from, which is the secret police. <laughs> and look what happened in France. Uh, you mean, yeah. in France, you mean? Yeah, what do you mean? I mean, with the state of emergency, which now Macron is trying to make permanent, uh, which essentially threw away France's data protection laws for anything that they say has to do with security. Oh, no, no, it's uh, way broader than that. It's for even uh, economic interest of the state. Really? Yes, and it's the government with the prime minister with which can spy everyone they wish. But uh, I had a question with the training that uh, how does that look like? Can you take, for instance, uh, conference video recordings? I have no idea. Okay. That's not my field. Is there someone we, who knows? Uh, can you take conference uh, speeches, recording, and make your voice recognition out of that? Well, you have to have something from, from the little I know, it's not enough just to have an audio recording. You have to know what the words actually are. You have to label the data. I mean that uh, okay. you have, because most of deep learning is uh, supervised. So it's about collecting a lot of data and labeling them. So the network can train. That's why it's a lot of work. If oh. you could just go around to people and say, would you like to read this passage into my microphone? Or just ask, you, say, invite some friends over and say, hey, everybody, do you agree I can make recordings of our conversation and use it to train the free software for speech understanding? That would be easy. But the thing is, that's not enough. You have to indicate what the words actually are and how and which time periods correspond to each word and so on. But then we could run uh, like a Google and Facebook or whatever that produce output. Maybe you could. Maybe Fair. you could. I don't know. <coughs> Indeed, that's an option that's appealing. If we could use the proprietary software to label our data, then maybe then it would be usable as training data. A small summary of why uh, Linus Torvalds selected GPL2 and doesn't want to move to 3 or later. Oh, well he told me that he is in favor of TiVoization. Does everyone know what TiVoization is? Raise your hand if you don't know. 
Tivoization is the practice of releasing a free program to run in hardware which is designed to refuse to, to detect modifications <coughs> and refuse to run modified versions. The name comes from a product called the TiVo, which was the first to do this, and it did this with Linux. So the TiVo came with a particular, ver a particular compiled version of Linux. And it came with the source code. You could modify that source code and compile it, and then it wouldn't, it wouldn't work properly in the TiVo because the TiVo's hardware would detect that you had modified it. It would make a checksum, it would see that it was a modified version, and therefore some features would not work. So after I thought about this for a few years, I came to the conclusion that when this happens, the the source code is free, but the executable is not. <laughs> and this is one of the differences between free software and open source. The definition of open source only looks at how the source code is available. It's meaningless to ask the, the idea that an executable might not be open source, even though the source code is open source, is meaningless. Open source is a question about this, it is a criterion about the source code only. But free software is not defined that way. So, um, so it's meaningful to say this, uh, this source code is free and the compiled executable made from it is not free. And that's how I understand it to be in the TiVo. The source code is free. You can modify it and use it in all the ways that you would want to use free software in. But the executable that comes with the TiVo is not free because you can't modify that and run it. Not in the TiVo and not have it do what the code says it should do. Now, it's not just the TiVo. Many products are TiVoized, including, I'm told, many Android devices. It says the case nowadays, but before there was Motorola who did that. Sorry, what Motor did you say? Motorola in the past they did it, but uh, nowadays it's less the case. Oh, so oh, well, I'm glad to know that. In any case, uh, well, I guess that will help us to some extent that they're not doing that thing that totally screws us. Uh, but uh, the theoretical issue doesn't change. So Torvalds said he didn't want to move Linux to GPL3 because he wanted to permit TiVoization. But why? Why, why, did, why does he like it? I don't know. Um, I didn't discuss with him why. I didn't ex it didn't seem useful to try to convince him to change his mind about that. There are interviews on the internet. He says because it's only interested about the source code. No, no. Uh, so. For Linux Torvalds, I don't know. But what I heard from the Linux Foundation is that it's a uh, on groupment of Entropies is 501c6, so they care about what the company cares about. So they care more about upstream project and so on, and don't care care way less about the users. So they prefer the companies to be able to do whatever and so. Uh, users. So yeah. it's a corporate problem that companies that invest into Linux, it, uh, if they move to GPL3, they cannot sell some of their, of their Linux-based products, right? I think it's something like that. I don't know exactly, but it's in this line. Actually, even Microsoft is a member of Linux Foundation. Yes. So yeah, and you can't expect that they're promoting any good 
policies. They, they, the policy they are promoting uh, are in their interest and not in the user yeah. interest. So, right. Uh, I, I I was actually wondering. I know that uh, there are many cases when uh, different companies copy paste uh, a lot of uh, GPL uh, code uh, to their code bases. But in the same time, I haven't heard much about. Uh, court cases where uh, uh, open, uh, when, when free uh, software communities sued uh, large companies to change their license to GPL because we they copied it. We sued uh, Linksys. And uh, what was the result? They, well, eventually they gave in and settled. Mm -hmm. But uh, is it? I think maybe if uh, it will be a common case, maybe uh, some. Uh, there are a whole bunch of maybes. I can't tell you about maybes. But uh, you probably need more people that do that also. Uh, maybe Bradley Kuhn is probably the only person which who tries to enforce the GPL uh, on a, from the community point of view. So. But can it change the situation if companies? There's no answer situation? to silly questions like that. Okay. You, it's, it's silly to ask. Why? We don't know the future. You're asking for an answer nobody can possibly have. We, All we know is that there are things we might try to do. We can't tell how successful they can be. But if it's done now, we can look at the results. Well, it has been done. Yes. It has been done successfully. Mm -hmm. But when you ask a question at a time, but have we really got a chance to succeed now? No one has an answer to a question like that by the nature of it. So they were on newer lawsuits uh, since like that? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, several. And uh, you can look up the, free, the soft uh, freedom conservancy yeah. foundation, uh, software conservancy foundation. And they run several uh, GPL enforcement lawsuits at the moment, and one of them is against VMware, for example, yes. and there are several others, so they are, they are doing that. And before attacking the companies, they try to educate, so in, in order to have the companies release source code and comply with the license and so on, but uh, so the one who which doesn't comply at the end gets through, but yeah, it takes time. About the Freedom Box project, which we learn about, uh, do, do you see any practical uh, results of this project? Uh, not only software, but also hardware. Well, I haven't seen any. That doesn't mean there aren't any. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A couple of years ago, the Freedom Box distro had a problem. It had some non-free drivers in it because the hardware they were proposing to run it on was not freedom respecting. Uh, and supposedly that's going to be fixed. It's fixed. I can't hear you. What? It's fixed. They don't advise uh, using Freedom Box on hardware that has such problems. Oh, good. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. Newer hardware doesn't have such problems. So. Oh, good. Well, then I hope they will get their distro uh, examined by the FSF. Uh, it's uh, Debian. The, the distribution is Debian. I don't understand what that means, I'm sorry. Uh, what they are doing is they're um, writing software, packaging things, but they're doing it in Debian, so it's not a separate distribution, it's just they wrote a Debian installer to install it on specific hardware oh. and... Is it not That's unfortunate free? because we can't, we can't endorse it as a free distro mm -hmm. if it's called Debian until Debian fixes its problems. Indeed. If they made it a separate distro with its own name, like the Freedom Box distro, 
then we could judge it on its own, and then I hope that we would consider it a free distro. GNU Sense could just do that. Just take the last main of Debian and uh, patch the uh, Maybe they could. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. It's a little old. GNU Sense is a little old. <laughs> well, basically, uh, they could. Someone could do that. If someone decides to do that, that might be good. All we can do is wait and see if somebody does that. Maybe one of you would like to do that. The point is, that's a thing somebody is going to have to decide to do, and then it could get done. And there is a list of uh, software with problems in the Libre Planet Wiki, and there is also the GNU Linux Libre mailing list, which can both help uh, doing that. Sorry, when you say a list of software with problems, that's 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 so vague. I have no idea yeah, what yes. it means. A list of software which doesn't respect the FSG, the Free Software Distribution guidelines. Sorry, a list of software. Yes. What software are you talking about? Application programs, yes. distros. What? Well, I'm lost. All packages that are in distributions. Oh. Uh, such as Debian or whatever. And uh, there is on. Uh, Libre Planet Wiki, there is a list of such programs and the issue they have and uh, link to work ah. tracker and things like that. Could you email me the URL of that? Because yes. I didn't know that. Okay. And I think I should take a look at it. Okay. Well, I have a question. For, are there official GNU standards for readability of code? How easy can be? There are, oh, there's a little bit of that in the GNU coding standards. Some of the things in there are for readability and maintainability. But it's, it doesn't try to do anything profound. I've seen also some interesting uh, projects, uh, pretty new, from the free software, uh, from the European uh, Free Software Foundation, uh, which is uh, to, let's say, compete with Google in searching in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, and I tried to obtain uh, package for the Red Hat based distributions, I I didn't uh, get. Uh, I'm I don't think that's a very. I don't think that that relates to free software at all. Basically, when you consider any kind of network service, where there's a server that provides the service then the software involved divides into two, uh, two groups. There's the software a user has to run in order to talk to the service, and then there's the software that runs in the server and implements the service. Now, for the user's freedom, what's needed is that the software that the user runs to talk to the service be free software. In addition, there are things you shouldn't try to do using a server. Namely, anything that's your own computing. You should do that on your own computer with your own copy of a program. You, just should, you shouldn't use a server to do that, no matter what software it's running. That would be SAS, Service as a Software Substitute. Now, this program is not uh, based on the uh, client-server model. It's only peer-to-peer. Okay, I'm not sure that makes much of a difference. Here's why. If the spidering is done in a distributed way so that there are a lot of nodes and each, nodes, each node looks at some parts of the web, I don't see that that's better than depending on a server to look at them all. Either way, 
it's not under your control, it's under who knows whose control, but not yours. So, as I see it, the main issue involved, okay, well, if we look at Google search, you can use it with just free software. Because although it does try to run JavaScript code on your machine, if you block it, the search still works. So uh, the political issues that arise for web search have to do with bias. And these issues may be significant. A number of leftist websites or progressive websites apparently had a big drop in their Google search visits last April. We looked at GNU.org and it turns out that it had a giant drop in Google search visit visits in April 2016 and then it decreased yet again uh, a few months ago. We used to get 800 or 900,000 visits a month from Google search. It went down to 200,000 and now it's under 100,000. We can't see any explanation for this. We looked at GNU.org we, we tested GNU.org against their mobile friendliness tester and we know that Google demoted sites that don't seem mobile friendly. It says that GNU.org is just fine in terms of mobile friendliness. So there's no uh, acknowledged explanation for why our traffic would have gone down so much. I see. So, uh, there are a number of issues concerning Google search, but they're not free software issues. They're unrelated political and ethical issues. And I don't, well, having a distributed search engine would give people the opportunity to make communities the opportunity to set up different kinds of search engines with different rules and thus uh, deal with whatever kinds of bias they see as a problem. But they, there's no direct free software issue there. Um, I don't know. It would be a lot of work. And un unless we saw some specifics about what are the, what kinds of questions are interesting and for, and why is it useful, then we couldn't even start. If people came up with an interesting question to ask about these logs, well, the easiest thing would probably be for us to just calculate the answers to those questions ourselves by running some simple program over the logs. There is a why I can't hear you. By each word, I think about five of choice. When you have too many choices, you are paralyzed by which one to choose and maybe uh, this is the company strategy to... Uh, I don't know. Uh, this is speculation. Do you have any basis to think that this is really happening? To have basic what? No. You have just made a, a wild speculation. Uh, no, I, I trust that the uh, person would say that when you have too many choices, you want... Maybe that's true, but if you are you saying, if you're asserting 
that this explains Google searches changes, we don't know that. Okay. Maybe you could study the question if you can find records of what Google search was returning in the past, you could compare and you could see what kinds of changes have occurred. The problem is getting that. I don't know how to get any information about what Google search returned for some kind of search, uh, say, in January 2016. I wish I could. If I could get some searches and compare their results in January 2016 and their results in May 2016, I could learn a lot about what actually changed. But unless somebody saved a lot of Google search results from January 2016, I don't see how we could find out what actually changed. Well, not necessarily about searches. Not about searching. In general, with software, free software movement. Uh, uh, what are, what might be the good things of this uh, kind of uh, practices? Which kind of practices? Uh, in, in which uh, companies remove freedoms from users? Well, uh, I don't believe any secondary benefits can justify it, so I think the question doesn't matter. If a person thinks that convenience is very important, just as important as freedom, then you could imagine that some change that denies freedom to people might it lead to some increased convenience of something, and a person who values convenience highly might think it's a good thing. But I know that no matter what answer I would find to is there some convenience benefit, I would say that's not important. So uh, companies might be motivated by this kind of thing, but I wouldn't care. And uh, therefore I'm not interested in spending time finding out, but you might be interested. Have you noticed the, uh, a drop in, in searches even for other uh, search engines, not only Google? Some dropped and some rose. I mean Bing and Yahoo and the, the major ones. I think, I think one of those went up. I don't remember exactly. But yes, we looked at that. And there was no clear pattern for the other search engines. There's a Wikipedia article named Personalized Search where they show patterns between uh, competitors of Google dropping and uh, the Google alternative raising because of uh, search issues because they tend to promote their own uh, services instead of their competitors. So you're saying that people uh, rebel against Google? No, I'm just saying that Google uses its power to uh, shape uh, search results for its own interests. Yeah. So that's a clear example of uh, where it drops and reason why it drops. Oh, I thought you meant that uh, Google usage by other people drops because they... they no, 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 it's like they are, they are, there is Picasa and there is Alternative and with uh, messing with the search results, it's uh, their own, their yeah. own yeah. services get promoted and people tend to use that more and other services tend to it's an established fact that they skew search results to favor their own products. Indeed. Oh, yeah. Not surprising. Does Google, does Google offer a 
freedom promoting products. <laughs> <laughs> but this is all, almost official. They, they officially recognize it that they will promote the, the companies and the, the, the result search, the, the searches for the companies that give them money. to us what would happen to DuckDuckGo if it made a change in its policies it's a purely out of nowhere question and it doesn't relate to free software much well or maybe it's a question of uh, who do we trust and who we do we well support. that's a different question who, you is, see. who do we support because if you use it, we support it and we promote it, and we can help them uh, to gain their audience, their users, user base. And if they um, uh, abuse uh, this trust afterwards, uh, if they uh, abuse uh, the, 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 um, the fact that uh, they gain this user, user base because of the privacy, uh, that basically our responsibility because we promote them. So maybe we should not promote uh, services with, which would uh, do that, uh, with, which, which doesn't have any protection against that. Well, I agree and I think we're already doing so. But oh, a lot of people in the software community actually promote that, that they will. Well, I haven't studied the alternatives. I don't do a tremendous number of web searches, you see. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't important enough to me. hardware like FPGA, we, it's a reprogrammable chip which can act like a GPU, a Wi-Fi chip, or Ethernet chip and so on. Uh, nowadays we have a small FPGA that works with a free software toolchain, but um, some, some bigger FPGA could uh, like enable free software in more fields and so on. Uh, the problem with FPGA is is that they involve secret data formats that only proprietary tools can generate. Reverse engineering is needed to figure these out and well, please do it. Okay. But uh, the, the question was rather uh, where does it fit in the urgency, importancy and... Well, I don't know. You just worked on the reverse engineering task list. The only place we say anything about that kind of question is there. Okay. I'm not, I don't know enough about the hardware products and how, I can't judge which ones are more important. Maybe you can. Yes, but the, the question was more general. It was like if it enables new field, 
How, how do you if it enables what? New usage of computing, new fields, new things that were impossible before. Well, it's not new fields of computing. It's making computers that maybe we could run free software on. Yes. I can't judge that. Maybe you can. I know GNU Herd is in active development. When do you think it will reach the status where I know nothing now? about that question. Basically, the GNU Herd is no longer high priority. We have a free kernel. We don't need to replace it with another free kernel. We need to make it libre. Well, it is. Linux is. Free. It, it, when I say free, it always means leave. Uh, Linux is free software. Now, the blobs are not, but those are separate programs. They're just packaged together with Linux. And the purpose of Linux Libre is to remove the blobs. But Linux itself, the program, is free software. We don't have an urgent need for another free kernel. Now, in 1990, when we started developing the herd, we had an urgent need for a free kernel because there was none. That's the reason why we started developing the herd. And it would have been nice if the herd had gotten ready sooner and had become a big success and people had added to the herd all the nice features that they've added to Linux and it were used on millions of computers. But the crucial thing for the free software movement is to have a free kernel. And since we already have one, making another one is not an urgent project. In general, if you have a free program to do a certain job, making another one is not urgent for the community. And I urge everyone who wants to advance freedom to pick projects that will do things that we can't do now in the free world. Don't pick a project to replace this okay free program with a technically superior free program because that's not a crucial change. Try to replace proprietary software. That's what we need to replace. Every time you make a free program that does a job that previously only proprietary software could do, you liberate people. Whoever was subjugated by that proprietary program, you liberate them. Whereas if you make a free program that does a somewhat better job than another free program, you're not liberating anyone. You may be giving them more convenience, it's not a bad thing to do, but it's not something we urgently need. Uh, but actually, according to the latest tendency, I mean, most of the software that we use is often software as a service, like Google. We, well, or no, no, no. First of all, software as a service is a meaningless, a confusing term. We, we're, you're talking about talking to servers, and they do various different kinds of things. But what's that got to do with anything? Uh, some things you shouldn't use a server for. Then for other things, things for which there's no reason not to use a server, well, use them. Uh, the thing is that it's just convenient for people to charge cost, uh, customers, so they put uh, things that should be made as a tool, like a tool uh, with web server, so they can charge... I don't know what you're user. talking about. What are these tools? What do these sites do? Could you give a specific, one specific example? Because I don't know what kind of things you're talking about. What you said is so abstract and general that it, I can't get a concrete, practical meaning out of it. With an example or two, maybe I could. Well, there are many web editors. I don't want to know about many. What's one example? Do you use any? Uh, well, uh, 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 
Well, it depends on how you define it, because for I don't know. I don't know. Why don't you give a concrete example so I'll we'll know what you're talking about? Google Docs. Google Drive. Google Docs. Okay. Google Docs. Well, you shouldn't use that because it's stupid to uh, hand your data that you, your files that you're editing to hand them to a company. That's really stupid. Also, as it happens. You can't use Google Drive without running Google's non-free software, and of course you shouldn't run that. But you could imagine writing in a browser extension that would talk directly to the server using its API. It may not be documented, but there is an API. It's what the JavaScript code uses to talk to the server. One could figure that out and then write a browser extension, a free browser extension, that would talk directly to the Google Drive server. Then you would solve the free software issue. But it would still be stupid to hand your data over to Google. If it's encrypted? Uh, I don't think it is. We can make it encrypted. We can make the add-on. Encrypt the well, I guess you could. I don't know if you... Maybe you could. I don't know if you could in that case. Don't assume it. If, if you haven't tried or someone hasn't tried, we don't know if that's a possibility at all in the case of Google Drive. We can imagine a different service for which the users could encrypt it. Maybe that would be okay. Although I would hesitate to use it because I wouldn't want to tell Google or any other such company who I am, I'd have to talk with them through Tor so that they wouldn't know where I am. Uh, it's a, I'd rather just have it on my computer. That's where I have it. But the main feature is there is collaboration, not editing. I do collaboration by emailing people my latest draft. Then they can run a diff. The Abbey Word program also can do collaboration. Uh, what did you say? Abbey Word. It can also do collaboration. Abbey Word, Abbey Word which is a word. Yeah, I, I often can't tell what you're saying when you're speaking English. Say it in French. Richard, I'm afraid that we have to um, close the session, uh, this topic. Okay. Uh, but we can take one more question uh, if somebody wants to. Well, add. basically, in a way, you're right. A lot of people do things through services. And they, since they don't see why that's bad, they like it. And we can't possibly compete with that. And it wouldn't make any difference if we did. Because if we ran another service to do the same thing that Google Drive does, it would have the same problems, too. But if uh, there is an open, oh, sorry, free, uh, uh, free uh, server that you can deploy on your own machine and use it, that means that you are liberating people from using Google Drive because they can well, okay. uh, deploy the Google people, Docs themselves. If the people who are going to collaborate run free software on their own machines and those programs talk with each other, then that is a step up. But that's architecturally very different from Google Drive. It's a distributed system rather than a server. So really, we should aim to replace server-based collaboration systems with peer-to-peer -peer collaboration systems. I think this brings us to the next talk, which is free software social networks and federation protocols. Um, Senya will be presenting. Thank you, Richard. Applause. Okay. Mean, meanwhile, I can uh, uh, introduce you. Um, yeah, you can you can set up. Uh, I need to bring my laptop. I, sure. I'll need another one because I don't think I can connect. Anything. Can we have like projectors? Yeah, yeah. The, the keyboard is there. Uh, I don't have BTA, so... Yeah, uh, I have an adapter <laughs> Which one? here. Well, HDMI to VGA. Actually, I would prefer to have another laptop if possible. Oh. Yeah. 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 Ye
So, um, a series of lightning talks uh, uh, will come next, uh, starting with uh, uh, Diaspora. Uh, this is a federated network uh, that is running uh, uh, free software. Um, and this will be presented by Xenia, who is a contributor to Diaspora. He's originally from Russia and uh, lives in uh, Ukraine. We are very glad that uh, he's been able to come to uh, Collaborator. This is the first time we have uh, guests from uh, Russia uh, and Ukraine. Next uh, is going to be a talk um, on um, making music with free software. Um, and it's going to be very fun. Uh, the electronic music produced, uh, made, made with uh, free software is very nice. Um, and a fully free digital G-scale is used for making this. Um, after that, uh, it's going to also, this one is uh, presented by James from Australia. Uh, another uh, step uh, up for uh, our conference to have a guest from Australia. Uh, he has to travel for 30 hours to get here. Um, after James is going to be Georgia, uh, who will present uh, the past and future challenges of Hatch Hacker Space. Wait, it does he eat? It has, but it's a different shape, so... Next uh, is going to be Dima, uh, originally from uh, Republic of Moldova, currently a uh, union citizen uh, and colleagues of ours in Bucharest. With parametric modeling in the free CAD and almost CAD. Um, those are uh, free software. This are free software to design uh, you know, manager, so you make lost here. Uh, 3D models. Right. And uh, the final lightning talk is going to be given by Rusan, uh, who comes from uh, Bulgaria, Sofia, uh, will going to give us a talk on cryptocurrencies and uh, their cryptographic basis. Thank you for um, deciding to stay with us for these amazing lightning talks, which I'm sure will be very energizing. Did you do a thing before you remove the drive? A lot of rules. I love the 
can read it. Uh, no, I'll leave it, leave it. Okay, no, we'll do that. Okay, the five now. The same thing. Um, maybe it's just can you swap the displays? Can you just read it export it to PDF and uh, Okay, I'll do that. That would be easier, I guess. So uh, yeah, we were talking about uh, um, P2P, uh, which is said about P2P um, replacement. So uh, it happens that I'm working uh, on diaspora, which is not peer to peer actually. It's a uh, so called federated uh, social network where we have servers. Um, from uh, what I can see myself, um, actually, uh, implementations of our peer to peer networks are not uh, too well state. Uh, the Main uh, yeah what 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 I am not uh, now talking about is not a part of my talk. It's just what came to my mind when uh, Richard was was uh, telling about it, and uh, I'm uh, saying about this to create a connection between his, his position and what uh, I, I'll actually talk about tell about. So um, yeah, uh, one of the examples uh, of peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks uh, I can think of is a retro-share uh, network. Uh, it actually works peer-to-peer, -peer, but uh, they uh, they have problems with the user base, and they have um, because it is useless. Yeah, uh, you can do many things there, but well, it, it can be useful, but um, Mm, they still have some uh, technical and design issues to solve. For example, they have hard times uh, dealing with uh, abuse because they uh, they were having abused by uh, some sort of spam or. What I do? I'm using Dom oh. instead of my window manager. Okay. That was so. So yeah. Um, so still, um, yeah, you can deal with abuse. There is no, there is basically no uh, designed way to deal with abuse in peer-to-peer -peer networks, and that can basically kill everything. And, I, and that just what uh, I'm taking from the talk, and uh, there might be some more issues with that. Um, and that's why uh, we possibly need some uh, step before we can actually get there. Uh, to full, fully peer-to-peer -peer networks and actually implementing a federated web with uh, 
servers, uh, which... Oh, thanks. Great, thank you. So basically, uh, having federated web with servers can be a start for that, and you can... Um, um, uh, you can have your own server, and uh, the design allows uh, eventually, at some point, uh, allow users to use it both as a server of uh, hosted somewhere and as a peer uh, hosted um, their uh, their own um, hardware, and um, that's why it's. Uh, in my opinion, it's legitimate to work on that, even though it actually serves and we trust the third party. So that's uh, on that point. Uh, I'll get to uh, my actual talk. So uh, I'll tell about federated social web and uh, protocols uh, <coughs> and implementations. So uh, to, uh, to the state that we actually. Um, uh, is, uh, from my perspective, uh, of a contributor of a social, uh, uh, federated social app. Uh, so, about me, uh, I'm Senya. Uh, I am from Moscow, uh, and uh, some time ago I moved to Kyiv. Uh, I'm a software developer uh, and free software supporter. Uh, I contribute to the Asper project and uh, uh, I value uh, solving problems in a proper way. Uh, so that's what I'm basically trying to do in my life. Uh, so some basic terms. Uh, I'll try to be fast because we don't have too much time. Uh, so um, what we sometimes call um, a federated social network is actually uh, should be called federated uh, uh, social media platform uh, because social networks is the thing which connects people and uh, software and services are media platform uh, for short we'll call that federated social networks uh, um, so Normally, uh, they are implemented as web services and, um, and federated social networks. There are nodes which are connected to each other uh, in the web and um, each node is, accessi is accessible with some URL. Um, so, some uh, points in this talk. Uh, I'll briefly do some um, review of protocols. Uh, I'll speak about the issue of multi-protocol or single protocol approach in social networks and um, mm, selection of uh, specific protocols and uh, issues of development of social network protocols. So, uh, these are a few uh, free software social media platforms uh, I find them notable to mention. Uh, there are much more of them actually exist, uh, but uh, I could cover only what happened to get into my attention, and uh, um, uh, there might be some other awesome software uh, um, which I'm not aware of or which I'm maybe not interested in. Uh, so that's what I mentioned. Uh, so uh, here is the list of platforms and uh, uh, protocols that they actually support. Um, uh, so, <coughs> uh, you may notice that some of these uh, projects uh, uh, are inter interoperable and some of them aren't. Uh, so, uh, in order to be interoperable, uh, to talk with each other, uh, two platforms must uh, talk at least one same protocol. Uh, I will get to back back to this uh, interoperability uh, later, and uh, uh, let's discuss some protocols first. So there is um, <coughs> um, 
there is uh, a stack of uh, W3C uh, protocols. So W3C stands for World Wide Web Consortium, and, um, and they have a so-called social web uh, working group, which defines standards for social web. Um, so this uh, scheme uh, renders the confusing relationship between the specifications they introduce. So there is a web shop, which is basically uh, Atom uh, or RSS uh, protocol with uh, an addition of notifications, uh, a subscription to real-time notifications. So you may, you may know that uh, you can subscribe to RSS feed, but you will fetch it only when you actually uh, tell your RSS feed reader to do that. And um, WebSub actually supports, um, makes it possible to receive notifications real time. Um, there is also activity streams which uh, define a structure for data transferred over Atom. Uh, so um, it defines documents uh, which it sends, for example, uh, notes, audio, lights, etc. Um, and uh, WebSub and activity streams and a few other protocols which I intentionally uh, avoid to mention for simplicity, or so-called all status, which is a set of protocols which um, um, uh, implement, which were implemented in GNU Social and which define GNU Social uh, social media features. Uh, also, uh, W3C Social Web Group um, <coughs> introduced uh, activity for protocol, which uh, using Activity Streams protocol, and um, uh, instead of Atom, it uses HTTP REST-like interface. So uh, they uh, send, uh, they exchange messages by using HTTP POST or HTTP GET methods. And uh, so Activity Path and Post Status both are implemented in Mastodon social network, uh, which is seen by some people as a um, successor of new social. Uh, and ac actually activity path uh, is likely to be a successor for WebSub, but that does for sure. Uh, I um, am not aware of any official statements about that. Uh, so at the moment basically W3C recommends two incompatibles because those status and activity path are not compatible to each other, but W3C uh, recommends uh, two incompatible standards uh, with different, different technology stack at the same time for um, uh, social media features. <coughs> um, so, uh, there is also uh, the Asper protocol. Uh, it is uh, similar uh, technically to activity path protocol. Um, in the implementation details, details but uh, it uses the same HTTP POST and GET request. Um, so uh, the content, the messages we sent, uh, are defined by the original implementation, which is Diaspora Federation Ruby Gem, which is we use in Diaspora Social Network, um, and uh, it's doesn't look similar to WebSub, so um, uh, WebSub is, uh, uh, works differently than the Asper protocol. Um, um, yeah, the thing about uh, the Asper protocol is that we don't develop it in a conventional way, so we, uh, unlike the uh, W3C social group, web group, uh, we uh, don't specify it first and then implement, but we implement it and base our specification uh, on our implementation. So we uh, basically specify and implement them at the same time in our software. And our protocol documentation is shipped along with our implementation uh, and exchange along with that. So we basically develop the Asper protocol on fly. <coughs> There is also ZOS protocol, which is used uh, in HubZilla. Um, so uh, ZOS protocol is a very advanced 
It has lots of features which the diaspora uh, has requested for years and uh, uh, still it's used by few people. Um, Mm, so the the share of protocol usage of that protocol is the last the least of among the other protocols of social federation. Um, so let's actually take a look at the usage share. share. So I didn't find any data on uh, Google Social. Uh, perhaps it was it's not just not monitored, but it doesn't look too much. They have. Uh, about maybe 10 nodes, so um, I don't, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem there is an active community. Um, <clears throat> um, Mastodon is notable here because it was created on the, a year ago and it had explosive growth of user base. Uh, my, as, as I think, uh, of it, um, it is because it uh, provides some fancy content, user experience features, uh, which are missing missing in other networks like diaspora. For example, they have automatic post language recognition. Um, uh, diaspora, in turn, uh, had some good media coverage in the past. It keeps maintaining the same level of users for some time with no significant growth. Uh, Diaspora uh, is the only federated uh, web project which uh, has a large amount of users and which exists for that long. Uh, so we, at least we managed to not to lose users at Diaspora because we, can, we uh, managed to maintain a good quality level. So I can say that Mastodon hasn't passed uh, the same verification by time yet. Uh, so it's not a technical issue, but it's a matter of uh, organization of development process. Uh, Hubzilla uh, had more time than say Mastodon, and uh, they, as I said, they have a more advanced protocol, uh, but it has quite few users, uh, and it's not the guild of protocols. So Hubzilla um, introduced a lot of new concepts, which are hard to catch, uh, to catch for the us for users. And uh, software is very fl flexible and allows lots of thing things to do, but uh, because of this U UI is overly complicated and most people who uh, try to use it just get lost. So well, that's why I think it's not actually popular. And well, social home, I, I, I won't tell anything about it. It's a young project, more experimental, so uh, let's see, maybe they become popular sometime. Uh, so, what outcomes out of the um, users share? So, users like fancy UI and UX features, and they pick uh, networks based on what, what features network provides. Uh, um, and users don't care too much about what what uh, is actually runs, or what is what is being used uh, behind that. Uh, so if, even if you use school protocol and you uh, are not user friendly, you won't uh, be popular. Um, also, as we can see, if, if we can if we take a look on the, if we compare um, uh, protocol list and user share, we can see that uh, popular platforms actually support only one protocol uh, and. Uh, Platforms uh, which support multiple protocols have compared to the low user share. Uh, so why can't we just implement a decent popular platform which talks to everyone and supports every known protocol? So uh, uh, I guess the reasons are mostly uh, about uh, um, uh, that it is very hard to do. So uh, both Mastodon and Diaspora, which are popular social networks, uh, are Ruby on Rails applications. And in R Ruby on the real world, uh, it, um, the technique of development adopted, which is called uh, test-driven development. 
test-driven development implies that you cover every feature you have in your code with uh, tests before you actually implement this feature or at the same time. Uh, so uh, you can ask every person that uh, had practice in test-driven development and uh, they will tell you that writing tests actually takes about 80% amount of development time. Uh, and it's totally worth it because uh, it is a requirement for high quality of software. Uh, and we can see that high quality in the diaspora. Uh, uh, so, uh, in spite of even the shortage of human resources that have in the diaspora. Um, so, uh, actually, even each protocol you implement required it to be covered with tests and uh, that multiple, m multiplies the work need to be done by the number of protocols you support. Uh, if you look at the multi-protocol networks like Hamzilla or Prendica, uh, they don't uh, basically have any test coverage. So, uh, they have some test coverage but it's far from being uh, proper. Uh, but software doesn't remain unchanged and software is updated and that means if they uh, have new com contributors and uh, if some new contributors arrive to the project or some new heavy development is performed it's likely they will break things and it's not something acceptable from, for a project which uh, aims to be useful to many people um, Also, projects with small user base, they just didn't face and didn't solve problems of uh, growth, growth uh, which the diaspora had solved and uh, spent a lot of time on that. And uh, the same thing, uh, the growth, growth issues uh, will make it harder to, uh, to, to be solved will be hard to, harder to solve in a multi-protocol application than a single protocol application. Um, um, so, basically it turns out that there is no such project which can actually um, support the uh, good quality and multi protocol uh, at the same time. Mm. So maybe we don't need custom protocols at all, maybe we just uh, need to drop diaspora protocol or Zot protocol and uh, um, stop developing, developing them in favor of specified protocols by such authority fragmentation like uh, W3C. Uh, uh, we can take a look uh, at XMPP actually, uh, which is here for about 20 years. And um, XMPP is well defined. And, uh, the same, at the same time, it suffers from fragmentation. Uh, so, uh, still, uh, some people who use different client server and server set, uh, they might fail even to do some simple things like sharing files. Um, so otherwise, every client and server has to implement every feature uh, of every specification, uh, which results uh, in pretty much the same requirement of multi protocols, supporting multiple protocols. Um, and that again requires too many resources. So, is it actually a good idea to design social networking protocols with a conventional approach? So, the conventional approach is when we design protocol first and then we um, uh, implement the actual production software. Um, you may have heard of uh, Roxy Marlin Spike and his blog post called The Ecosystem is, movement, is, is Moving. Uh, Moxie Marlin Spike is a signal messenger developer and he he claimed that um, you can't um, mm, he, that, that 
At first, they wanted to introduce federation uh, to signal messenger, but then they decided not to do that because um, uh, because uh, uh, supporting federation uh, can't uh, allow them to update in time. So she basically claims that federation is dead and uh, we don't need federation anymore. Uh, we should uh, stick to um, centralized services. Um, <coughs> So every software developer is aware of that fact, the fact that software can never actually be finished. It's uh, our li life is changing, our demands uh, to our te technologies change uh, as well. And I can't argue that. Uh, but uh, what I can argue uh, is uh, the claim that federation can't deal with these changes. Um, so if we don't respect changing demands of users, in the, in the federation, we basically end up with something like email, uh, by which I mean uh, popular protocol stacks like SMTP, IMAP, POP3. Uh, so email is basically a federated service, and mail is used by everyone, and it is the lowest common, common denominator for internet communication. But still it is obvious that mail doesn't meet up-to-date demands, which by today include uh, forward secrecy end-to-end -end encryption support enabled by default. And that's what's provided the proprietary software. <coughs> um, so, um, basically, we need protocol changes because of the moving of ecosystem. Um, if we don't um, change, if, if, if we can't create federation protocol which tolerates changes uh, will basic, basically freeze it. It will be either ab abandoned or uh, kept along with the inconveniences it brings. Um, so, today for the ASPR protocol we, uh, there is no even need to specify all the, all the changes before we meet, implement them. We are in person contact with each developer of every compatible implementation and we just discuss the changes with them and implement them straight, straight away. Uh, if our ecosystem grows uh, and there are more parties we need to uh, inform, we can establish a more sophisticated infrastructure for discussing the changes, but basically the principle is uh, the same. Uh, we can deal with the changes without the prior formal specification. Uh, so, uh, if we change protocol often, how we, do we deal with backward compatibility? Uh, we could develop an extensible protocol like XMPP, but that doesn't seem to work well. It turns out uh, to require too much resources, just like multi-protocol support. Supporting all versions of protocol along with the new ones also is a special case of multi-protocol support. So, um, what we deal with in the Asper social network is basically we are dropping uh, support of old compatible versions. Uh, in the past, the Asper dealt with that uh, by making time frames where when we supported both all all the new versions uh, because we can't update the whole federation at once uh, because we are not in control of the uh, every service uh, every server. And, uh, and that's a good thing, uh, because Maxim Arvin Spike is actually decided to keep control of all servers, uh, and we don't want that. Uh, we want users to control the servers. Um, but what if uh, some nodes of the network refuses to update? Uh, the node administrator is free to run all the versions of the software, um, but we can't afford uh, keeping the network synchronized with them. Uh, we just don't have resources for that. Uh, and eventually, uh, this will give more freedom to users if we keep us. Uh, uh, we can we can give more freedom to users if we choose to keep supporting the old versions. Uh, and that's actually not a big issue if we can't say that with uh, another feature called account migration. 
So the point of ground account migration is to allow users to move their accounts from one node to another without losing uh, any of their data or any of their connectivity. Uh, if some node is abandoned and not updated, a user could, could move to another one. Uh, this way, if uh, we drop support from, for some uh, old protocol version, uh, we have a time frame uh, in which user can decide to move, and maybe even after that, because uh, well, account migration support doesn't require, may not require this part of um, protocol change to be used. Um, so uh, this way, users uh, have the freedom to change uh, the node they use at any moment, including moving to their own their own node. Uh, you can imagine this like if you could change your email provider and email address without the need to expl ex uh, explicitly inform all of your contacts about this. Uh, so that's something that no big federated uh, network ever had in the past. So by having uh, account migration, uh, uh, we'll be less dependent on the decisions we make in the past. Hamzilla had implemented that uh, as a part of those protocol, uh, the diaspora is implementing this at the moment and will hopefully get this before the end of the year. Uh, uh, so, um, I will be short. Okay, cool. um, so, um, so, federated social networks, uh, the, I talked about are based on free software, but they are not just software. They keep distributed data, and a lot of new problems uh, arise because of that. Um, uh, so I can speak of that now because I don't know about about the problems which can arise. But um, definitely, it's more than just free software issue. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, federated social networks can give us more freedom. Uh, so uh, I just invite you to try uh, federated social networks out. Uh, you can join Diaspora or you can uh, join any other federated social network of your choice. Um, I haven't done any links, unfortunately. So, but if you are interested, you can actually ask me. I, I will, I will tell you because we are short on time. Um, and um, um, so, you uh, can contribute to the future of the federated social web. We have a discussion platform where, where you can actually uh, participate and. Uh, Join discussions and uh, influence the, deci the decision we make. Uh, our uh, discussion platform is based on discourse. Um, so um, that was my opinion, and um, um, it doesn't define any directions or by which diaspora or other, other projects will move in the future. But uh, actually, you can come and uh, define that direction as a community member. So, thank you for your attention. Uh, questions? No, to be very sad that we would not have time for questions, but... Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. We'll because, yeah you can uh, you just catch me and here around and uh, uh, feel free to ask me again. I, I just wanted to make a point that uh, the, the rumors of new social deaths have been uh, highly exaggerated because if there is active development just not on the new social uh, uh, initial implementation. There is post active. I guess maybe you mean uh, Mastodon actually. No, no, no. no? Mastodon is never mentioned. It, uh, Mastodon is a re-implementation in Ruby, new yeah. socialist PHP. Mm -hmm. um, I think 
I diaspora not can talk about the cells. No, I was not. This there must be some plugin because I was subscribed to some well someone on the diaspora instance. It's clunky, but it works. What what did what did you use? No social. No social. I don't know, maybe in the past they had this because uh, they tried to stick to some standards, but that maybe was uh, long ago, like 2012 or 2013. Uh, they could just drop it afterwards. I don't know what, what's going to happen now. Will uh, James give a talk now? Yes. yes. So while James is preparing, maybe you can uh, ask him something else. What happened to Identica? Identica, I think it was converted to Frentica. Well, I I listed it on okay. colors. So, well, pretty much by a feature set similar to Diaspora, but they are all multi protocol. Uh, uh, and. Uh, oh, if I'm not confusing anything, but yeah, there is. Uh, our, status, our status is actually uh, uh, the Arena Audio. Yes. No, maybe this game will close. That's a lot of net because your post status. So, uh, you could say. Uh, this one here? Uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
a MIDI controller or even if you're recording live audio, if there's a, much of a delay, it can cause a lot of issues in terms of timing. You won't be able to play in time and it's just, it just doesn't work. So this is what we use to manage sound and this stops Pulse Audio and takes over. So this is what the connections look like here. And as you can see at the moment, I already have it set up. So our door is this here. Hold on a second. Move it across. So this is my digital audio workstation. And this is where, I consider this kind of like your paintbrush. So this is where you lay all your tracks down and all your MIDI information. And from here, you can arrange the, your sounds and your recordings. So at the moment, it's set up so Argo is outputting to the speakers above us. So that's our output. And we don't... You can also configure, configure your MIDI controller to run into Argo from here and a bunch of other things. It can get quite complicated quickly, but that's just a rough overview. So that's QJAC CTL. Uh, and then, so this is okay, Studio page, we'll talk about that. This is Zenab Sub Effects. So, when making music with Linux, sorry, you know, slash Linux, you often will want to use a synthesizer to create some sounds. So, this is particularly useful for electronic music. The best, well, most comprehensive free synthesizer that we have is Zenab Sub Effects and it allows us to make a wide range of sounds. Uh, this, what you're seeing here is actually a closed source interface called Zen Fusion. It's not currently released as free software, but it will be in December. So this will improve the usability of the synthesizer a fair bit. It's not currently out though, so I'm still using the old interface, which I'll show you in a moment. But this will be, it'll be cool when this is free software, so that's coming soon. And this is also the Ardor uh, project's main website, so you can donate to them here, and you can read about it more. They have a lot of cool, cool things going on at the moment, and it's developing quite quickly. So now we'll jump into Ardor, and I'll show you a little bit about it. So here is a MIDI channel, which just has a few chords, which I will show you how we can modify the sound with the Zenodes Hub effects in a moment. And here we just have some audio tracks. So the way I like to work with drums is just with audio because it keeps things simple. So from here I can also apply uh, processing effects to the drums to shape the sound to be the way I like it. So here we have a kick drum, which I have a compressor running here, which is showing on the wrong screen. Hang on. So this is an audio compressor, uh, typically in studios, you'll see these as, as physical hardware. When working in a, a digital audio workstation, you quite often reach for a virtual compressor. So this is all done with software. And pretty much we have close to feature parity now with non-free software. So this has existed, a lot of these plugins, in the same form in proprietary software for a long time, uh, and these days we also have pretty much all of the same features that you would find in a non-free software, so that's really cool. And so essentially what this does is it reduces the dynamic range of a piece of audio, so uh, I'm not really sure. The can, best. You, can you start this again so we can see how it works? Because I saw it, was, it has some visualization. With what, sorry, what does the compressor? Hang on, I'll just loop this. Yeah, so as you can see here, here's some visualization. So this will indicate how your sound is being compressed. Uh, and this is just a typical setting you would have on a kick drum, for example. Uh, and so you can add more layers to this, like a snare drum, and then a hi hat just to get a little bit of a beat going. Uh, so that's cool, but you don't have as much control with samples as you do with synthesis. So just here I'm going to insert an instance of Zenad sub effects, which is the synthesizer I spoke of earlier. So 
So this is the old school interface, which is free software. Um, the problem with it is it has a lot of menus that kind of pop up, so things get messy quite quickly. But it's really powerful, so we can do a lot of we can do a lot with it. It's very very useful. So for this particular sound here, let's just select the track. That is the default sound you'll have when you start the instance of Zenad Sub Effects. So that's just a sine wave, which is the most simple waveform you can have. Uh, it's a single hum, a single frequency. So that's just the the frequency of the note that you see here. So that's literally just if we're playing a C C note, it's literally just producing a C sound. So there's nothing else. Um, and what gives a musical instrument its sound is what we call timbre, uh, and timbre are the harmonics associated with that sound. So you'll have the bass frequency, and then around that bass fre frequency you'll have a bunch of other sounds. So with Zenad sub effects we can do the same thing, we can produce different timbres for different effects. So in dance music you, you'll see a lot of saw waves, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select a saw wave. So this is starting from scratch. Uh, actually a power wave, which is similar to a saw wave, it's just a little bit harder in, in sound. We'll see in a moment. So, if I now press play, you can hear a lot more harmonics there, so it creates a more interesting sound. And now we can use a few different features to shape that sound to, to, uh, to give it different effects. So this is called subtractive synthesis. So if I can open a visualizer for you, I'll show you what that actually looks like. Um. Scope. Maybe scope. Yeah, we want a spectrum analyzer. Hang on a second. Does the order matter in the... In There's the... nothing playing at the moment, so... Ah, uh, so you'll see here... It's not so useful actually, we won't worry about that. But anyway, a saw wave is... I can't remember the exact uh, harmonics it's using, but it's pretty much all of them. Or some, something like that anyway. So... So what we'll do now with the filters is we'll strip away parts of that sound to create different effects. So that's what subtractive synthesis is. It's you start with a bass sound and then from there you work your way back and remove frequencies, for example, or change things. So uh, we'll create a basic plug sound at the moment. So this, this is a low pass filter. So we'll just turn all this on. Boost that. So these are attack and decay values. So attack is how quickly the effect's going to kick in, and the de decay is how quickly it, it decays, essentially. So how long it takes the effect to stop. So we're going to set the decay value all the way. Uh, so that's our starting point. We want it to start with this filter open to the highest possible point we can set it to. And then with our decay time, we we're going to have that around 60 to start with. And then from there, you'll, you'll, you'll just work, work, work it out what sounds better just by tweaking and making slight adjustments. Uh, so, And also, the other tweak I wanted to make was the frequency spread. So at the moment, we're using one saw oscillator to produce these sounds. So that's, uh, there's only one saw wave per note. So what we can do, though, is we can multiply this and then we can spread the detuning of each of these. So what you do when you spread the detuning is you create a wider sound. So I'll boost the stereo. So what this is actually doing is creating multiple saw waves, or power waves, they call them in this software, but they're essentially the same thing. And it's panning them across the st stereo spectrum. So stereo, you have two speakers, and then it's splitting these saw waves between the speakers uh, rapidly, and that creates a 
really wired sounding sound. Even though you physically haven't, you know, extended the range of the speakers, it's just it's a psychoacoustic effect. It just sounds a lot quieter. So that's also useful. Um, and now I'll give you a little, little bit of a listen. First with the filter open. So I'm not sure how loud this will be. I'll turn it down a bit. So that sounds, I'm not sure if you can tell from these speakers, but that's generally going to sound a lot wider and powerful. Um, if I loop this now, Now we have a plus sound. So the filter's starting nice and wide and then closing quickly, so that creates a kind of plucked effect. So then well, from here we can do many things, but the first thing I like to do to, to um, sounds like this is add an e EQ. So I don't want too much low frequency for a sound like this because our drums are using a lot of the sub sub bass so we'll just add a st standard EQ here Show this for now. and I'm just going to do something really simple for now turn on the high pass filter maybe have the roll off on 36 decibels yeah and there we go ah so here's the analyzer so here you can see the frequency content of the sound we're producing, so this is useful. So you can use one of these analyzers to determine which frequencies are too powerful, and this can help you equalise your track and balance it out, because you don't want too much uh, low bass, because this will create a muddy sound and it will make, make it more difficult for people to listen to your music, so that's useful. But it's best to use your ears, so generally go with what sounds good. So, um, you don't have to stick to too many rules with music, but it's still useful to have these tools as a second reference for when, I don't know, you're doubting, doubting your ears. So. Uh, so leave that on there. And next I'm going to add a sidechain compressor. What is this? So a sidechain, yeah, I'll get into that. Um, I'll just insert it first. So another common effect you'll hear in dance music is a kind of pumping sound. And the way this is achieved is through something called sidechain compression. Uh, this is actually a new feature they've just added to Ardor recently, and it's really useful for this type of music because it's a lot easier to do now. You could do it before, I think, but I never worked out how to do it. So, <laughs> But it's really easy to do now. So essentially what sidechain compression is, is it's like a noise gate sort of thing in reverse, um, except you're, yeah, it's kind of like in reverse. Uh, so every time a kick drum plays, for example, so this is our main drum, this thumb here, you can hear the sound, both sounds are playing at the same time, and they don't mix so well. So now when the kick drum plays, what we're going to achieve is the, the sound of our synthesizer is going to duck, like a noise gate. So the sound's going to be reduced when the kick drum plays, and then when the kick drum finishes, the sound will rise again, and this gives us more room. Because in dance music, you want a really loud kick a lot of the time to get people dancing to it. So this allows us to pump up the volume of our kick while also maintaining, um, without clipping. Otherwise, we have something called digital clipping, which just causes distortion, and yeah, no one wants that. So, tap. That's okay, at least a bit shorter. Ratio. Start with a low ratio. And now we have to change the pin connections. If I can remember how to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, here we go. So we want to side chain from our kick drum. So now that's sending in. So what I just did then was take this audio track here, which is our kick drum, and route that to send to the compressor, which I set up on our synthesizer channel. So what this will do now is we'll, we'll feed into the compressor and allow us to 
So I change from Mac. And we can customize this effect. So we can have it as dramatic as we want it to be. So let's just loop this so you can hear the hear me make changes. So it's still playing, but of course it's ducking a fair bit. So now the sound is ducking with the kick, which means we can make the music louder as well. Uh, and the next effect I like to add, I should have added this before actually, is a bit of a delay on the on the synthesizer. So this just makes it sound a little bit more interesting. Instead of just having the same notes playing over and over, it just adds a little bit of dynamics to the sound, it makes it move a little bit more. So cut vintage delay. I didn't mention this project before, but these plugins you see here are developed by the Carp Audio Project, and they're really high quality. Uh, I recommend using them if you're going to get into music. So a lot of what I'm uh, talking about here in terms of plugins and digital audio workstations, it's also important to remember that this is these tools can be applied to acoustic music as well. It's not just electronic music. Uh, these tools are perfect for working on acoustic instruments as well. So. So you can hear that movement happening now um, in the background. So now that we have a bass beat going, we can add other melodies to complement that. So I'll get rid of the delay. And I'm just going to show you now the instrument bank. So before you saw me build a sound from scratch, which is great if you know how to do it, but in the beginning it's a lot easier to use what are called presets. So they're pre-made sounds, which you can get using right away. So there's a cool one here. I can remember what it's called. Uh, Portal to the yeah, I like that one. A lot of keys cannot be pressed at the same time for the virtual keyboard. For the virtual keyboard? Yeah, that's correct. You uh, want to press all of them? Can't. If you have a MIDI controller, which I don't have with me, I have one at home. Uh, you're familiar with MIDI controllers? It's like a, it's a keyboard it's which you would plug in by USB generally. And uh, with this you can use all the keys at the same time. I think it's just a limitation with uh, laptop keyboards. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No more than two keys at once. 
Two keys and pause? No, the yeah. three combination of the computer keyboards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you, you can place, uh, press like six, key, six keys at once. And that's how much it will transmit. Like. If, you, if you have a mini controller, you can play all of them. It's just, <laughs> it's actually the keyboard. It's not okay. a software limitation as far as I'm aware. Uh, so. so, yeah, so now on top of this, uh, we can try recording. Uh, we won't try recording something because it'll be out of time because of my keyboard, but I'll just try it j jamming over the top with my, <laughs> with my limited ability because of this keyboard that I'm using. So, these are, yeah, so I'll just loop this again. Given time, you can produce something a lot more <laughs> complex than that. But I hope that just gives you a little bit of an idea of what Linux, uh, Gnu slash Linux is capable of in 2017. And the future is looking bright, so it's only only up from here. Uh, yeah, I think I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. We were wondering, what does the panic button do? Yeah. The, <laughs> sorry, what, what which button? The panic button. Well, the oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that, so what, what that does is if occasionally, I'm not sure if there's an issue with this anymore, occasionally the synthesizer would start making like a loud noise you can't control. So what the panic button does is if I, let's just see. So you see the audio playing the blue bar there? If I hit the panic button, that will just mute the sound so that you can avoid any loud screeching noises that might be, might be produced. So that's all that does, it's just a sound mute as far as I'm aware. Yeah, usually when you're doing lots of people, when yeah. yeah. adding multiple effect effects in my loop. Like, yeah, so, if, so yeah. in the past that was an issue. Um, it might still be. So that's why the panic button's there, <laughs> so you can save your ears. Uh, could you open your favorite tracks that you produced with this software, just to see uh, what... With this software, I haven't... Uh, I actually don't have my hard drive on... Well, I have my computer hard drive, and I don't have my portable hard drive on me, where I have some other projects. But in the past, I've been producing music with proprietary software, and the reason for this has been because, in my opinion, anyway, this, the audio software, audio free software, um, wasn't up to scratch for what I wanted to do in terms of applications. But recently, this has changed, so that's why it's become more usable now for the, these purposes. So, in, yeah, I have I can show you some tracks I've done proprietary software, but with this particular software, only recently I've started to. Be able to and do as things. I understood, you also contributed to the source code of the software? No. Ah. No. Just a demonstration of how it works. Okay. Have you heard of Do you have a YouTube channel? No, I don't. Not at the moment. <laughs> Where do you upload your songs? SoundCloud? Oh, I, haven't been, I haven't shared any of my music so far online. Oh, I had a SoundCloud at one point, but I deleted it, so. Okay. But, yeah. Have Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Really. Have you yeah. heard Overtone? Overtone? No. What, what is oh, that? It's, it's, a, it's actually a closure DSL that allows you to do basically what you're doing graphically, but using code. So you can, it's a DSL that allows you to compose music by writing code, closure code. I've heard of C Sound before, which is a sound library built, of course, off, off of the C programming language. And that allows you to do a similar thing to what I think you're talking about, in that you code your music. Mm -hmm. 
but I haven't heard it over time before now, so I'll, I'll be interested to look that up though. Yeah. Have you heard of Sonic Pi? Sonic Pi. Sonic An application Pi. for Raspberry Pi to make music. No, I haven't. I have seen a cool application of the Raspberry Pi though, in which someone took Zenad Top Effects, this synthesizer here, and they built like a physical synthesizer in which you had hardware knobs which controlled the yeah. parameters. See, see so. Sonic Pi is very productive. Okay. I'd like to see that later, yeah. Would you find it uh, convenient that you have a continuous spectrogram when you are synthesizing the music? Like yeah. FFT, the fast Fourier transport. Yeah, so that's what they... I generally, I do use one of those, yeah. I find that useful. Like I said before, it's more important to use your ears when making music than to use a spectrogram. But as a second reference, it's good to have a spectrogram because sometimes there's things happening in the low frequency which you might not be hearing at the time. But if you then took that music to a club, for example, there could be issues with low frequencies. So definitely good to keep an eye on what's happening. Uh, you can uh, pass filters and uh, so on. So. Uh, uh, is there such a feature in this uh, software? To, to, for a spectrogram? Of course, a uh, continuous spectrogram which uh, follows uh, the waveforms. Yes, there is. There is. Ah, that's interesting. Um, I can find it for you, but it'll just take me a while to okay. go through my plugins, so yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Can you the image, the image on the desktop, can you take that? This is, no, this is uh, from Truscale, actually. Oh, Built in. It's quite nice, I like it. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were passionate in astrophotography. No, um, I appreciate it, but, <laughs> but no, I don't, I don't do any photography myself, so yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, Sonic Pi uh, is something like this. You write a uh, code. <laughs> and plays like this. Next. If it can. Okay. And if you want to see spectrogram. So you type. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> oh, my. I can do that. You, you have to write panic function. <laughs> no, I've got to stop recording. <laughs> <coughs> yes.